<laughs> okay, good morning. Welcome, everyone, to BC309, our course on urban church planting. We have uh, so far journeyed through um, the, uh, the initial section where we've been talking about um, we talked where you spoke about the the practical aspects, how to uh, get started, just covered uh, a wide, wide range of things. Then yesterday, we were just looking at uh, different models of um, of you know how people have started or pioneered churches um, over the last several decades, different ways that people have gone about it and how God has, you know, used it in the church to bless the church. And, you know, we can look at those models and we can definitely learn, uh, understand the pros and the cons, what, what went well, what um, uh, didn't succeed and so on. So uh, it's a good learning. So we're going to continue from there today. May I just request somebody to pray with the class and then we will move forward. Can somebody just pray together please and people pick up. Pray. Uh, Sir, can I pray? Sir, can I pray? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Anyway. Anyway. Okay. Good morning. Uh, Father, we thank you, God, for today. Breathe upon us the breath of life, that the words and the work you've committed to our hands will flourish, oh God. We thank you for Pastor Ashi. We thank you for the counsel in his heart, that he will communicate it effectively. And the light and the life of God will be better than us to do the great of God in these times, oh God. Thank you for everyone, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So let's uh, just pick up. I was just kind of giving us um, <clears throat> uh, a little overview of uh, various church models, uh, church uh, Church growth models, where people are pioneered. Uh, we'll just go through that, and uh, and you know, if there's anything that interests you, you can definitely explore that uh, a little bit more, right? So uh, we talked about the Euro Full Gospel Church in Seoul, Korea, which even to today, till today, is just a powerful testimony of uh, what God has done. Um, the International Charismatic Mission, Bogota, Colombia, uh, Isu Darbar here in Allahabad, Calvary Temple, um, that used media in a, in a very big way, Crystal Cathedral, um, how Robert Schuller, you know, thought completely out of the box. He, and he had, his, you know, a, a theater and he had a drive-in. <laughs> People could drive into church and sit in the car and listen. Uh, this was back in the... 1960s, 70s, and then how we use television. Uh, Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith, you know, we talked about uh, how he reached out to the hippies and, you know, the, the, the kind of music accommodating uh, just totally brand new style of music. He was open to it and it made a huge difference. And then it still continues today. Today, you know, we sing contemporary songs, but the person whom God used really in those days to make that, to welcome that kind of music into the church. Uh, it was Chuck Smith and the Calvary Chapel. Willow Creek uh, came up with, you know, the Seeker Sinister model. We, we looked at the good and the bad, uh, what worked, what didn't work. Um, and, uh, uh, and I would say that at, at one point, and I would think uh, like about 10 years ago, there was a big creative church. Uh, so they kind of, they, went took the seeker sensitive model into like a one step forward of a creative church now uh, where they try to keep every message you know really creative and so on bring in those aspects uh it, it was okay but then i think 
um, the 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 uh, the same problems where the the focus became more on you know what would what creative thing would the pastor be doing today to get the message across rather than the message itself. So uh, that kind of came out of this uh, anyway. So then we have uh, the purpose-driven church model. That's something uh, many churches have adapted and followed. Uh, worship music coming out of Hillsong, which was a big thing, was a big blessing to the body of Christ. Um, we talked a little bit about how uh, the first major use of the internet was driven from Mars Hill Church, um, how uh, they kind of showed you know, how uh, a sermon preached on a Sunday could then be made live on the internet and accessible by hundreds of thousands of people and so on. That So they kind of drove that whole thing and then lots of other churches started doing that. Um, and then we spoke a little bit about Elevation Church uh, and of course Mars Hill also started doing it where they were having satellite churches on live stream and so on. But remember, that was actually actually implemented in the early days by full gospel, you're the, you're the full gospel church. They actually set up satellite centers and were connected connected uh, through satellite. So uh, back in the seventies, uh, eighties, you know, uh, they already had done it, uh, but uh, the use of the internet and live stream and satellite campus kind of caught on here uh, in in the uh, in the latter part or in the early part of the two thousands. Um, and what we have seen, um, uh, a tremendous explosive growth in Africa. And if you see what God has done in Africa, of course, you can trace it back to, you know, it goes all the way back to David Livingston. He came in as a missionary and so on. But I think uh, some of the major people God used, uh, one was T.L. Osborne uh, as an evangelist. Uh, in the in those days, the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, they would have these big open-air gospel meetings all across Africa. T.L. Osborne spent quite a lot of his time in ministry across Africa. And so that kind of brought in you know, the gospel in these big crusades and preaching and healing and so on. And subsequent thereafter came Reynard Bonke. Uh, uh, T.L. Osborne, of course, was from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Then Reynard Bonke was a German evangelist and later moved to the US. But Reynard Bonke took it up like, you know, many levels further uh, through all of his gospel crusades all across Africa. So when you look at, you know, what has happened, uh, these two people would names would stand out in, in, in kind of laying the foundation for what was to come. Um, uh, the, the evangelist Steele Osborne and his wife Daisy Osborne and then Reynard Bonke, uh, through the gospel crisis all across uh, Africa. Uh, it kind of it really brought in the gospel preaching with healing and deliverance uh, all across Africa. Then came out, then began, we began to see the emergence of uh, strong word-based churches happening across Africa uh, and, and the, the spirit-filled churches. Uh, exploding, growing, and then subsequent to that, we see, we, we saw, we observed the the prophetic move all across Africa, you know, God raising up men and the, the emphasis on the prophetic and so on uh, happening all across uh, Africa. But then with that also came a lot of problems, which I think the church is dealing with today. Um, the, 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 the abuse of power and uh, you know the 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 extreme extent of you know of, of those in authority leadership misuse of power and money and influence and so on but overall if you see it look at it if you look at the big picture it's been amazing you know it's been amazing how the gospel has spread through so many parts of africa now there are still pockets countries you know in the on the continent that are still a lot of work to be done the closed countries uh, islamic countries that, that seem to be pretty closed but for the most part the gospel has saturated or has been spread uh, throughout africa it's amazing and, and the major emphasis has been the more of the spirit science wonders miracles 
and uh, healings and so on. So it's been it's it's amazing. So while technology has driven here, you know, uh, in the West, uh, uh, in Africa, it's been really the the work uh, God moving through signs, wonders, miracles, and so on. So we see, you know, uh, all of these things there. And uh, the final thing I just want to say is that. At, at, at APC, what we are trying to do is, you know, so, you know, we, we see all of these models and, and, and all of them are, you know, the, there's the good things in, in what we can see across the different continents, what's happening, how God is moving, and we can learn from all of that. Uh, what we've tried to do at APC is, um, uh, so, you know, Several years ago, actually, from the time we started, you know, there was always this question: Okay, what? How do we structure the work? How do we? How should we build the work here? Uh, what kind of model? What should we follow? Uh, what would work in this context? You know, where we are, and given the kind of people we're ministering to, um, what should we do, and so on? And several years ago, uh, what? Uh, what came into my heart was that just follow the blueprint that you see in scripture, which uh, was very interesting. And so uh, you, you would have learned it in the course on the local church. Uh, we have a book called The House of God that deals with the blueprint. Basically, in the New Testament, you find 10 pictures of the church. That means God is, God is, God is using these different pictures like example house of prayer army family lampstand wine and the branches bride um, and, and he's using these different pictures to talk about the church the church is this the church is this the church is a house of prayer and worship the church is an army of god is the army of god the church is the family of god the household of god the church is in a branches on the wine, the church is the lampstand. The church is all of these things. It's the pillar and ground of truth, and so on. So, what we said is, hey, we will just follow this blueprint that we are seeing in Scripture, a biblical blueprint, and basically work on developing God's people in all these ten aspects. You know, so create ministries. Or you can use the word programs or activities, whatever. Do things that are going to develop people in these aspects, in these areas. So that's kind of what we are doing here. And overall, you know, equip the saints, send them out uh, to do the work of the ministry. So, and and in the process, of course, you know, we can learn from all these churches, all these people who have done pioneering work in their countries. Um, yeah, and in their areas and their regions, uh, we can learn the good things from them, and then we can try to adapt them uh, to wherever, whichever region of the world we are working. And then, of course, improve on it. Get you know, take those ideas, uh, and if they make sense for where you are, uh, improve on those ideas, adapt those ideas to whichever region, part of the world you are working in, and and and, and see how you can pioneer the work and build the work that God has given, all right? So that was the intent here of just running through. Uh, and, and this, of course, is not a complete list of, you know, models to observe. There's, there are other, you know, other models, for example, uh, I know we could add to this list um, the Alpha Church, um, the Alpha program, which, which came out of, uh, I'm going to get the name of the church in in in, in the UK. Um, not getting his name. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, anyway, the the Alpha Church uh, Alpha Program, which again was such a blessing. It went all over the world. Uh, oh yeah, his, his name is Nicky Gumble, and right? so uh, Nicky Gumble, and how God inspired him to say, okay, you know, let me create a simple way to introduce Jesus to people, right? So he created it in his context in the UK Alpha program that is, okay, how do I introduce Jesus to somebody? So he created these simple lessons. 
But you know, that just took off. It just went to many parts of the world. So the Alpha course, as it was known, became a blessing. And, it, and, and in the UK, it's something very well known or very widespread. So that's again, a model to look at. So how he was doing a work there in uh, the church in Brompton, Brompton, UK. And he was doing work there. And, and then, you know, how God gave it the idea and it just was a blessing. So we could look at that model, learn something from it. Uh, we can look at um, other things that have taken place. You know, uh, for example, the Bible Study Fellowship, which again has spread all over the world. We can look at that and say, you know, what, what are good things that I can learn from it and adapt it, take it and, you know, and improve on it for your context. Let me pause at this moment to see if there are any questions before we get into the next section. Uh, all of you are with me, any questions? Can I ask a question? Please go ahead, please. Please go ahead, please. Okay, uh, I hope this does not sidetrack us, but I just, something, study I've been doing, at, and I kind of feel it falls in line. Uh, when it comes to mantles and callings, um, I did a study, different narratives, different, um, some call it anointings, some call it different things, but in, in the line of our study, um, I just want to seek your counsel about mantles and callings as it fit into our study. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Um, just give me a moment. I will. Uh, I will. I'm just going to get the link for. Um, um, just very quickly, and then I will also answer your question. I want to just give a link to some sermons we have. Oops, here it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, this might seem very complicated link, but anyway, uh, if you just go to our church website, APCWRG, and on the home page, if you go scroll down, look at the sermon series, there'll be a series of messages where I uh, talk about mentoring, anointing, impartation, and then we, in, as part of this sermon series, we also address about mantles and so on. So let me let me just quickly summarize, you know, in a very concise way, what the Bible says. So in the Bible, in Scripture. We see that uh, uh, anointing, which is basically the presence of the Holy Spirit, can is transferable. Anointing is transferable. You know, so for example, we have so many examples. In the sense, uh, Moses laid hands on Joshua. We have uh, Moses and the seventy elders. We have Elijah and Elisha, and then we have John the Baptist. So we have Paul and Timothy, and so on, examples where the anointing is transferable. Now, when we talk about the mantle, we're talking about God's empowering, resting on a person to fulfill an office. The anointing is the, oh, Louis has dropped out. Okay, maybe he will join us back. Let's just wait for Louis to join us back so that, he can get what I'm saying. Get what I'm saying. I'm back, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. I had to okay. 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 All right. So, uh, yeah, Lee, what I was saying was, uh, so the anointing is empowering the Holy Spirit on a person to carry out a work, whereas the mantle is more associated with the office, with the the place in the body. Right. So that's a mantle, whereas the anointing is for a work, the expression of the work of the Holy Spirit. Anointings can be transferred. But here's the thing. Uh, everything happens aligned to the call of God on a person's life. That's the first thing. And I'm trying to just summarize it. You can listen to this message series. It'll t tell you more. But first thing, we must remember, any impartation we are going to receive 
will only be aligned to the purpose of God, the call of God on our lives. So for example, and 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 I and I, and I I can use this as more in a in a very in a funny way. You know, suppose I go to Darling Jack and say, please lay hands on me. I want to receive anointing as a worship leader. Darling Jack can lay her hands on me. She can pour, you know, buckets of oil on me. I'm not going to become a worship leader. Why? That's not the call of God in my life. So the point is this. Anointing, impartation always happens aligned to the call of God on our lives now if Dal inject lays hands on me maybe to some extent you know maybe I can experience a little bit more grace in in personal worship or something but it's not going to greatly affect anything I'm doing because it's not aligned to the call of God in my life so impartation there is meaningless okay, so that's one very important thing so people randomly go to you know okay I'll, I'll have so and so lay hands on me and ask them to impart here I lay hands on look the impartation is always aligned to the call of God on your life you know what's God called you to do because the empowering of the spirit the impartation of grace and the operation of gifts is aligned to the call of God must understand that so it's not random it's not arbitrary it's not like I can go and just get somebody to lay hands no so secondly uh, uh, the uh, we must understand that the impartation of mental you know ultimately everything we receive from God John chapter 3 uh, I think it's verse 34 or 27 uh, John says a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven so this is um, John 327 a man John 327 a man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from heaven so no impartation nothing happens by the will of man it has to happen from heaven man God uses human agency to carry out what he has determined or he desires for that person so I can't just go and tell somebody I want your mantle give me your mantle give me your anointing hey a man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from heaven now God will hu use human agency to carry out what he has determined but ultimately everything we receive comes from God so even in the transfer of anointing or you know something that empowers the uh, the ministry and I, it's the father it's God who brings it into our lives he may use human vessels but he's not restricted to human vessels you can ultimately you can receive it from God without human agency you're not dependent on it third thing I would say is this everything that is imparted has to be developed otherwise it will be die right so Anyone can lay hands and say, okay, you know, God, God told me to impart certain gifts or anointing or a mantle, whatever. But it's of, still of no use in the sense it has to be developed. The person who is receiving it has to develop it through their own personal journey with God. And that's what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, Timothy, stir up the gift of God. That's when he mentions it twice, 1 Timothy 4.14 and 2 Timothy 1.6. Twice he writes to Timothy and says, Timothy, I'm reminding you, stir up the gift of God. What was given to you by the laying on the hands of the eldership? You know, stir up the gift of God which is in you. So, in other words, something was given to Timothy, but it will be useless if he does not work with it. If he doesn't develop. So, whatever is imparted, whether it's the mantle, gift of an, uh, an anointing, or gifts, has to be personally developed. Some other things we can also say is association is very important. Now, God can work even without association. That means, you know, and there are amazing testimonies where suddenly somebody comes, God sends somebody to lay hands on somebody, and, okay, you know, there's a powerful impartation. Now, the same man may have laid hands on, you know, maybe a 100 people or a 1,000 people, but the impartation took place for one person very powerfully. So we have those testimonies. But generally, what we see in Scripture is impartation takes place through association. That's why, you know, um, uh, Joshua walked with Moses, Elisha walked with Elijah, you know, and, and so on. It can, it's primarily through impartation, uh, through association. Uh, but we understand that it can also take place over generations or over the time. So, uh, you know, 
John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, Elijah, but there was no association. But it was the will of God. There was a transfer. The last one I want to say is, in most cases, impartation is always in part, not in full. So when Moses laid hands on Joshua, Joshua did not do all the miracles Moses did, but what characterized Joshua was wisdom. We read this in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, the last chapter, 34, I think. Moses laid hands on Joshua, and Joshua was full of the spirit of wisdom. So one aspect of what was on Moses was imparted to Joshua. Uh, Elijah and John the Baptist. John the Baptist never worked a single miracle, at least recorded for us. But he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. What, that, what was it about Elijah? He turned the heart of the fathers, turned the hearts of the people, and prepared the people ready for the Lord. So that aspect of Elijah was, was on John the Baptist. And you know, the only example that we have of a double portion coming on Elijah was because Elijah desired it. Right? And it was not something Elijah could give it, but it was John 3.27. That is, Elisha receiving from God twice as much as what Elisha, Elijah carried. Right? So th these are things we must keep in mind uh, when we talk about mantles, anointing, and gifts, impartation. Uh, I, I try to address that in this message series, so you're welcome to check on it. I hope I answered your question, Louis. This, 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 this. Thank you so much. Sorry for distracting distractor. But thank you. I'll go. I'll listen to Risa. Thank you so much. Mm, thank you. Mm, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I know uh, it is a little different, but I'm uh, happy to answer. Any other questions um, on on church growth models and how we can learn from others who have pioneered different works? Okay. Uh, just to mention in passing that uh, one one model I, I think that we can also add to the list is the house church movement, uh, which is uh, work that took place. Uh, and now this was, you know, I, I, I think this was more out, came out of necessity uh, in the underground church in China. And uh, then others also, uh, it worked in other places as well, where obviously because the underground church in China had to be, you know, meet very quietly in very small gatherings and so on. So the uh, they met in small, small, small groups, you know. So there was no big, like, you know, like what we are talking about, big churches, big gatherings. But the gospel spread through the, underground church the uh, the which then gave the whole idea of a house church that means you don't have to have big gatherings now there are advantages of big gatherings yeah you know hundreds or thousands of people gathering together uh, or there are advantages okay but that's not the only way god can work so and you look at china you look at what happened there you know there's a beautiful example that was out of necessity, but there's a learning there uh, that we can use house churches as a way to pioneer work. So, uh, of course, some you know some advantages are you're not worried, burdened with you know big buildings and facilities and all those things that come with having uh, big congregations. Um, and so it's very easy. You know, you can meet in homes and just multiply like that. But there's also the other side of it, which is a lot of coordination, a lot of uh, uh, how do you provide spiritual oversight uh, when people are, you know, in, in 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 many many small groups across the city. So that's the other side of uh, a house church. Now, uh, some of the ways that you can address it, and I'm just giving you thoughts to think about. I'm not saying you have to do this. Some of the ways you can do it is, of course, and especially today because we have technology, you know, uh, whatever content message is developed, you know, you can share it with the house church leaders. So the same message is delivered in every house church so that everybody is kept together. Uh, there's a much more closer form of accountability because the house church leader knows that, you know, that 10, 15, 20, 25 people who are coming to the house church. He knows everybody by name. He cares for everyone. So that 
you know that's much more closer and so if the coordination can happen and people can be cared for uh, in that manner so that's another model to keep in mind uh, in situation now uh, you know at certain points in time yeah, we were forced to for example i'm just thinking about one of our churches in uh, 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 Odisha state in India. Uh, so uh, I think it was, I think it was 2010, 11, you know, I forget the exact year, but there was a time of intense persecution in that particular state uh, against Christians. I forget which year, uh, but I think it was somewhere around 10 and so on. And, and people were being killed, and it was, it was very bad. And so we had a, we were renting a hall where the church was, and you know, a lot of students in the city were coming and so on. But when, the, when that persecution broke out, we had to close everything. We gave up that place. And so for a period of, I think, for two or two and a half years, um, the pastor there was only doing house church, meaning, gatherings in people's homes you'd go pray with them very quietly meet come back so we didn't start you know the larger gathering until we were sure that things were safe so in that situation you know, we were kind of forced to do this and so uh, you know he was taking care of about 60 70 people through these small groups meeting in different homes for that period of time then slowly when things seemed to have settled down we got back and now you know it's a very it's a good thriving church i think he has more than 200 people coming uh, there's a nice hall and prayer hall and all of that so we're back to the large gathering but in between when there was a lot of persecution uh, this really worked for that period of time okay so let's move now to the spiritual side of things we have covered all the you know the practical things. So these are things you do at practice and uh, and getting ready to pioneer a church or pioneer a work in an urban setting. Now we're going to talk about the spiritual side, and then in closing later on, we'll talk about the personal preparation. And as a person who's going to start a work, how do you prepare yourself personally? So that will be the last section. We're changing gear now. We are moving to talk about the spiritual dynamics. So in any work, any work, whether you're pioneering a church, a local church, or you are thinking of starting some other kind of ministry, you know, maybe for children, maybe for youth, maybe for families, any kind of ministry, we must understand there is a spiritual battle involved right in the natural yeah you know we can plan we can prepare we can organize uh, all those things are there we have to take care of it because it's the practical side uh, we have to do it well but there's a big spiritual side we are not just uh, doing an event uh, we are not just doing some kind of program. We are actually in a spiritual battle. Now, we have to bring this into the context of the city, urban church planting. Now, this is this applies whether a city or village or town doesn't matter. It, it all you know it applies everywhere. But I'm talking. We're going to spend a little focus on urban centers. In the beginning, we said God is at work in our cities. But we must also understand that cities, urban centers, towns, villages, there are also all kinds of demonic activity. Now, we don't tend to think about it in the cities because life is so sophisticated. Uh, <clears throat> we, we, you know, we are so involved with uh, our logic, our reason, our understanding to think in terms of demonic work demonic activity many times we can forget that because we are so caught up with natural things 
But I just want to remind us about you know what what is what is the devil doing in our city? And we're not here to magnify the devil, but we need to understand it because ultimately there's going to be a confrontation. You're pioneering a church for what? To win souls, to make disciples. The devil is not going to sit down there and just the demons are not going to sit down and just watch you doing your work. Or maybe you are starting some other ministry in the city. It may be to help some kind of people. It may be to you know uh, serve certain kind of people. Okay, wonderful. But at some point, you're going to clash with the powers of darkness because ultimately lives are being affected. Souls are being affected. So we need to understand this and we need to also engage in the spiritual spiritual dynamics. That's what we want to talk about. So in scripture, uh, we see spiritual beings who influence leaders over cities. So that's something to keep in mind that the people over cities, the leaders, the influencers, you know, we could look at it as politicians, uh, people in authority, are being influenced. I'm not, we're not saying they're possessed or anything. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that demonic powers can actually influence them in their minds, in their thoughts, and so on. Something to keep in mind. And that's where prayer and where comes in. We'll talk about it later. But the fact is, leaders over cities or over nations can be influenced. Uh, we see in Isaiah and Jeremiah, also in Ezekiel, uh, these things. I'm not going through the scriptures. Uh, you would have covered it in your course on prayer. So what is Satan work doing in hindering the salvation of the lost? He's blinding the minds of people. So through the philosophies, through the ideas, ideologies, through, you know, we, we use the word group thinking, you know, through these, these, these common, through these ideas that are commonly embraced by a big group of people, whether it could be a com community, it could be big communities in the city or multiple communities who embrace certain ideas or ideologies, the minds of the people are blinded. So when we look at scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, you know, Paul writes here, and somebody wants to read, could somebody read that please? I mean, I, I could quote all these verses and go fast, but I think it's nice to I just turn to the Bible and, and look at it. Second uh, Corinthians four three and four. Somebody could read that. Second Corinthians four three and four says, "And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ." Who is the image of God? Mm. So the Apostle Paul says, okay, see, these people are perishing. These people are perishing. They have not received the gospel, they are perishing. But there is something in between. Their minds have been veiled. But what is that? The God of this world has put a like a a curtain of blindness. He's, he's put something that is trying to intercept, that's trying to interfere with the light of the glorious gospel of Christ for penetrating into their minds. So, we are pioneering a church. We are pioneering some work. We want to, of course, we want to touch lives. We want to see people saved. We want to see them come into the kingdom of God. Okay, it's good. But the God of this world is interfering, trying to prevent the light of the gospel entering into their minds. So we have to deal with that. He's not more powerful than the church. He's not 
the, the God of this world is not more powerful than the believers. But the believers have to address what he's trying to do in order in, 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 in preventing the light of the gospel from getting to the minds of those who are perishing. Matthew 4.16, very interesting scripture. It's talking about Jesus. And somebody could read that for us. Jesus begins his ministry. And Matthew's quoting from the Old Testament. Please read. Go ahead. Thank you. People which sat in darkness saw great light, and them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Matthew is quoting from the prophet Isaiah. It's very interesting, you know, see how how what Isaiah prophesied is now being related to Jesus Christ. So the word of God. Um, and and um, uh, Matthew is saying, people sitting in darkness have seen a great light. Now, obviously, this is talking about spiritual things. It's not talking about physical. Spiritually, these people were in darkness. Jesus has come. The light is shining. So spiritually, they are in the, in the, in the region of of death, spiritual death, and to them, light has dawned. So, this was in Jesus' time, and it's also relevant to our day and time. That means there are people in our cities who are sitting in darkness. Now, we talk about spiritual things. They're sitting in darkness. They are in the region and shadow of death. That's what they are, spiritually. And to them, the glorious light of the gospel has to shine. But there is there are the there are demonic powers, the God of this world, saying, okay, I don't want that to happen. I don't want the light of the gospel there. I want to keep them in darkness. I want to keep them in the shadow of death. And so there's going to be clash, conflict. You and I are pioneering a work, starting a ministry, want to reach people, but there's the God of this world who wants to keep them in darkness. Isaiah, uh, Acts 26, sorry, Acts 26, 14 to 18 is a beautiful description of the call of God on uh, the Apostle Paul uh, and what God commissioned him to do. Now, it's uh, we're reading it in his context, I and mean, this is what God wanted Paul to do. But keep in mind, this is applicable to all of us, because all of us have been sent, like the Apostle Paul, to bring the gospel to people and see what is involved you know, in, in bringing the gospel. Let's read that, please. Acts 26, 14 to 18, somebody. Can I read that, sir? Go ahead, um, Kung Balum. Acts 26, 14, 18. Or was it Asha? I don't know. It's me, Pastor. God. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Arise and stand up your feet, upon your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I, have, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sent by faith in me. Mm. So, this is uh, a beautiful description of uh, God's call and commission, the Apostle Paul. But I want to focus there on verse 18, right? And, and, and this is applicable for all of us. So, the Lord Jesus has sent us but, uh, to proclaim the gospel, to pioneer a work, whatever he's called each one of us to do. But what is happening? Verse 18, as we go to people, we have to open their eyes 
so that they can go from darkness to light. Their eyes have to be open because the God of this world has blinded the minds. Their eyes have to be open. And notice it says here, yeah, from the power of Satan to God. That means Satan's got them in their power right now. He's got influence on them, over their minds. But we are here to bring them out of that into uh, the, the power of God so that they can receive forgiveness of sins. So their eyes have to be open. They have to come out of darkness into light. They have to come out of the power of Satan to God. So there's going to be this conflict. Right? And Revelation 12, 9 talks about how Satan goes around deceiving uh, the nations. So um, Revelation 12, verse 9, he is... Uh, he deceives the whole, I'll just mention it here. He deceives the whole world. Revelation 12, 9, the devil deceives. So what's he doing? He's deceiving the bias. Re, you know, putting in those wrong ideas, thoughts, flaws. That's just, they just embrace it, they're holding on to it. So the first challenge is this. Whatever work we're doing in the city, we are going to have to confront the blindness or the deceptions, the lies of the enemy that's holding people in darkness. Right? So that's part of what we have to do. How are we going to deal with it? This is what we want to learn in, in this section. Right? And uh, I remember a long, long, long time ago, um, I'll just close with this. Um, when I was in college, uh, for my bachelor's degree, yeah. so I was, this was engineering, so this was, um, but it was eight, eight, 1986 to 1990, it's a long time ago. Um, that was the time I began to learn the, these things uh, about, you know, the, you know, the things we are looking at in scripture. I began to understand, okay, so there's a spiritual battle involved uh, for us to win souls, uh, the devil is blinding the minds of people. There's going to this, you know, we're dealing with these things. So for me, that quest was how do I, you know, share the gospel? A lot of influence fellow students uh, with the gospel. And that was a time that uh, I began to learn these things. And then I, uh, I also started sharing this in a little Bible study. Um, there was a Bible study that was already happening in a, a particular church there so i got permission I, I thought you know i can get more more of these friends or believers involved in this and if i can help them understand what 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 this is all about maybe we can do this together you know so i started talking to them uh, i remember those sermon series that i was on the bible study series i, I was doing with them I, I think it was called uh, the battle for the lost or something like that and uh, I started doing it. We went through like maybe two or three Bible studies, like what was on Saturday. Then after that, they, everybody got scared, you know. And they said, no, no, stop. Please don't talk to us anymore about this. Because now we were challenging believers, saying, look, if we want to impact our student community, we have to deal with what the devil's doing. And they said, no, no, you don't want to get involved. And stop. So, I, you know, so I, I stopped. You know, we never continued on that in that group. But then, um, about a year, a year and a half later, I found some, there were some believers. You know, when we started uh, uh, another fellowship, I found some believers who were willing to understand this that we had to deal with what the devil is doing in the minds of people. And we took time to pray. Uh, every week we would go out to a place where we would pray uh, for about three hours as a group, as a small group, less than 10 people or so. And we began to pray for the student community. And then we saw, we saw the result of that. You know, we prayed for almost a year or so like this. And we began to see, you know, and, and, and a great work was established in that place. Um, more than 
and eventually we saw more than 200 students uh, get you know come be a part of the fellowship be filled with the spirit mighty work you know happening but it began with let us pray to deal with the blindness that's being put upon the minds of people so this is a truth we need to be aware of and we need to you know begin to address it uh, and we'll talk about it a little later and you know, what we can do to pray and address it let me pause here and uh, see if there are any questions i know it's already over time uh, but are there any questions on this Shri Kumar, go ahead thank you sir sir i just uh, have one question uh, from second corinthians 4 3 4. so my question is um um the paul is saying here um the god of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers mm -hmm. so i just want to know that the unbelievers are only gentiles or is it also applicable for the believers who does not want to believe on certain like for example some people does not want to believe on finances like you know, they wanted to live in a different way where they think that the poverty is from god so is that also possible some people say that uh, you know believe the christians they believe on uh sickness is something which um god permits because that is not the will of god i have to suffer because paul have that thorn so my question is is that also possible because paul is not defining just believe this unbeliever so even a believer who is not ready to believe on certain areas of deliverance can enemy blind them and that also can be possible thank you sir that's my question yeah the answer is yes uh in second corinthians chapter 4 verse 3 and 4 paul is talking about the unbelievers the unsaved but in second corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 to 5 paul is talking to believers and he's saying believers you have to cast down imaginations arguments or that's reasoning and every high thing that opposes the knowledge of god and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of christ so you know, Second Corinthians ten three to five is talking about arguments and reasonings that are contrary to the Word of God. So the Word of God is teaching something, but there's an argument, there's a reasoning in the mind of believers that's con that's opposing it. And so many times, when believers uh, embrace an untruth, something that is opposing the knowledge of God, uh, opposing the Word of God. Uh, that that has to be dealt with, and that's also from the enemy, right? Uh, who puts in those deceptions, those ideas, those wrong thoughts, those reasonings, those arguments, uh, and sometimes it becomes a stronghold, meaning it just sits like a fortress in their minds, and those things have to be pulled down. So the answer to your question is yes, these things affect believers and unbelievers but second Corinthians 4 he's talking specifically about unbelievers second Corinthians 10 you can see he's addressing uh, similar things in the case of believers thank you sir thank you you're welcome any other questions okay we will pick this up next week so we are, we are now moving into the section on the spiritual dynamics uh, to the work we are called to do. Uh, we need to understand it and then see how God is going to lead you to engage with it. Uh, there are different ways that we can engage, uh, uh, and, and uh, we will talk about it. Right? Let's pray and we will dismiss. Somebody could pray with the class and dismiss us, please. Anyone? Okay, let's pray. Yeah. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful time, Father God. Thank you, Lord, Father God, that you are unveiling things, Father God, which we don't know. Father God, as we go through this uh, 
Jesus and Father God, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You help us to, Father God, uh, all the things that you have, Father God, so that we will learn, Father God, and all the hidden things, Father God, we can learn, Father God, and we will use in our life, Father God. Father God, we pray for the pastor Arsis. Thank you for his life, Father God, and that you using him as instrument, Father God. Thank you for all the students, Lord Jesus. Thank you for everything, Lord Jesus. Rest of the time, we submit ourselves to your mighty hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, uh, so Thursday, uh, I, I'm going to be, uh, you know, in a place near Mumbai doing a conference. So uh, I found out that the conference starts at 10, so I may not be able to do my class on Thursday morning. So please excuse me this week. Uh, I'm only traveling two times this, two or three times this <laughs> uh, Mumbai. Then we have a big conference in Delhi uh, on the third week. Um, but I won't miss class. I'll go after my class. I'll go for the conference. And so I won't miss class that week. But this week I have to miss. Um, yeah. But excuse me this week. Okay. God bless. I'll see you all soon. Thanks. Bye, Pastor. Thank you, Charles. Mm -hmm.